And we move on seamlessly now to session four, entitled Advancing the Clean Energy Transition. And we have heard over the last day and a half a lot of compelling arguments for nuclear power's advantages as part of the clean energy mix. And we've talked also about the fact that to reach our 2050 climate targets, we need to boost that share in the overall world energy mix. So now we want to focus on what's standing in the way of doing that. What are the main barriers hindering greater use of nuclear power, especially in developing and emerging economies with burgeoning energy demand? What steps can countries take to reduce those barriers? And how can support and cooperation with the International Atomic Energy Agency help? Those are our topics, and we begin with a presentation taking stock of the major factors that countries need to consider as they seek to develop and deploy nuclear power innovations. Gloria Kuang is the acting head of the Division of Nuclear Technology Development and Economics at the OECD's Nuclear Energy Agency, and she also heads the International Forum for Nuclear Energy Cooperation. She sent us this video report. acting head of the Division of Nuclear Technology Development and Economics. Happy to be here to discuss the factors that affect the development and deployment of advanced nuclear. So to start, I would like to briefly introduce the NEA to those who may not be familiar with us. The NEA is a government to government organization with 33 member countries in Europe, the Americas and the Asia Pacific region. Our role is to assist member countries in maintaining and developing the essential scientific, technological, and legal basis for peaceful use of nuclear. With our members, we strive to provide authoritative assessments and support governments in developing effective nuclear energy policies based on science and, in, and innovative technologies. We function as a forum to share information and, and experience to pull expertise in addressing different scientific and, te and technological challenges. So with that, let's get into our topic today, factors that influence nuclear development and deployment. So as we have witnessed in the last few months, the pandemic has highlighted the importance of electricity security in the world. Electricity is indispensable to ensure the smooth operation of essential activities like the medical services at our hospitals, the ability of, for many of us to continue our work online and the continuity of other businesses so that the world economy can continue to function. So nuclear is no doubt contributing to electricity reliability. But historically, conventional nuclear power plants are chemical, uh, 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 capital intensive. To ensure nuclear can continue to support the global energy demand and to build a low carbon resilient infrastructure, we need innovations. That includes innovations in technologies to lower capital costs and boost investors' confidence, innovation in developing viable business models to bring in other revenue sources, as well as the ability to attract investments in competing with other generation technologies. Now, in terms of, redu of reducing capital costs, designs such as small modular reactors already offer such benefit. The smaller sizes, simplified designs, shorter construction period, lower construction risk due to factory fabrications, all these will, bring, will make financing easier to secure. Especially decoupling civil construction and reactive manufacturing not only reduces construction time, but also allow plants owners to shift and reallocate financial risk during the construction period. The ability to add modules incrementally, or what we call scalability, reduces both the upfront investment and also allows investors to adjust to changes in electricity demand. All these can be translated to faster payback in the plant life cycle and enhance the management of investment risk faced by investors. And in the electricity sector, small modular reactors could be a good fit to replace some of the retiring coal power plants. For example, 25% of the coal generation units in the US are less than 300 megawatts 
which can be closely matched by the current design output of small modular reactors. And in the energy sector, nuclear systems can provide thermal energy to produce consumer products, such as hydrogen, which could be used to store energy on the grid, or as a feedstock to produce the other products, such as fertilizers or plastics to new synthetic fuels. The high temperature advanced reactors can work with renewables in powering chemical plants or water desalination projects, or in energy intensive processes such as district heating, petroleum refining, etc. So if nuclear systems can be leveraged to generate alternative revenue streams, the cost of nuclear can be offset. And needless to say, these, in, these innovations that help to increase the cost, competitive, the cost competitiveness of nuclear need government support, particularly well-structured governance framework and precise policies will be necessary. Next, we will look at some policy examples to see how they can accelerate nuclear development. But before we move on, I would like to draw your attention to some of our work. The NEA and other international organizations have, con have conducted many studies on nuclear innovations, cost of nuclear, nuclear financing, role of governments in transitioning to clean energies, etc. Although we don't have time to go into details of these reports, I do want to, to point out to you that all our reports are available online. Should you be interested in our, in our analysis, our technical discussions, or policy recommendations in various aspects of nuclear development, do not hesitate to download our reports or contact us. So to move on, many studies have concluded that if we are serious about reducing carbon dioxide emission, we need to consider all low carbon generation sources. Like the chart on the right, it is extracted from an IEA report. In their scenario analysis, it was concluded that nuclear is required to contribute to global electricity in 2050 if we want to limit the global temperature rise to two degrees. Nuclear plants help keeping power grids stable. Nuclear power generation nowadays can adjust its operations to follow demand and supply shifts. As the share of variable renewables like wind and solar rises, the need for dispatchability will increase. Nuclear plants can help to limit the impacts from seasonal fluctuations in output from renewables and enhance energy security by reducing our, de our dependence on imported fuels. And as, as we have said, government support is vital in supporting innovation development. Here we list three examples that can be effective in accelerating the development of advanced nuclear. First is nuclear uh, is policies that target stringent emission reductions, for example, carbon pricing. Carbon pricing can increase potential revenues of low carbon technologies and ensure competition on a level playing field. Without strong policy support and in a, in a market with low cost renewables and gas, cost of advanced nuclear would have to decrease substantially from the current estimate to make them economically competitive by 2050. So policies that value clean energy and energy security are crucial to the future economic viability of nuclear. <clears throat> Next, we know that nuclear power has high capital costs and requires investment. But our existing electricity market makes investment in any unsubsidized low carbon technology impractical. Countries that are interested in nuclear should consider providing policy incentives to aid private investment in advancing the, the innovation of low carbon generating technologies. We have seen innovation specific policies such as R&D tax credits or direct government support implemented in many industrial countries can encourage private sector innovative activities. We also know that public private partnerships can be effective in identifying areas that need government support. Government can also, may, may also consider investment policies that overcome financing barriers like price guarantees or long-term contracts or, or framework policies relating to trade laws which may bring in influential in innovations from abroad. 
And lastly, we think policies to support effective or efficient and predictable regulatory framework are very important as that will ensure the licensing process will not lead to project delays or cost increases that are not justified by safety requirements. Perhaps the stepwise pre-licensing design review processes used in Canada and the UK can be a good example here. Their approach provides early opportunities for reactor vendors to demonstrate to the investors that the reactor design technology will be licensable. Countries are working together to harmonize safety codes and standards to allow timely licensing and construction of reactors for demonstrations. These are crucial elements in facilitating the development of advanced nuclear and will support cost reduction. So before I continue with, with other factors that, that, can affect, that can affect nuclear development, I would like to quickly explain how the NEA design our activities on nuclear innovation. The figure on the left shows our work is designed to address different technical and economic aspects of nuclear in both long and short terms. The different focuses of our activities are summarized in the boxes, which may not be easy to see here, but you can always find out more, more details of our work on our web pages. And on the right of the slide, I provided two upcoming events that are relevant to, to nuclear innovations for your information. We don't have the time to go into details, unfortunately, today as time is very limited, but please do not hesitate to contact me after this meeting if you have any questions about our work. So to continue, the development and deployment of advanced nuclear energy systems will require highly qualified and skilled people. Unfortunately, according to some studies, nearly a third of nuclear professionals are age 55 or above. The aging nuclear workforce represents a major challenge to bridging the gap between the generations. So to support advanced nuclear, the industry needs to make sure that the transfer of knowledge happens between the retiring and new employees. Bilateral and multilateral partnerships already exist. Countries join efforts to conduct research, sharing facilities and results. There are also international cooperation platforms like the IFNEC, International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation, or GIF, the Generation 4 Forum, which facilitate information and experience sharing. These collaborations need to continue, and when possible, cooperations need to be deepened as nuclear technologies continue to progress towards commercialization. Both industry and government, including regulators, need to recognize the importance of, chemical cap of human capital and workforce development. And appropriate investments in information management, knowledge creation and transfer, as well as training for the next generation of the workforce are essential. Lastly, I would like to share a few concluding thoughts here. Whether there is a pandemic or not, reliable electricity is an essential need. Nuclear is able to provide that today and to support the increasing global energy demand in the future. For us to meet our ambitious climate target, we need to consider all low carbon generating sources. A cost effective low carbon electricity system probably will consist of variable renewables, dispatchable zero carbon technologies such as nuclear, and a residual amount of gas fire capacity. Policymakers need to take actions today, now to support market reform, so that the clean energy and energy security attributes of low carbon generating technologies are valued. To design effective policies that would ensure electricity reliability and support the global energy growth while protecting the environment, we need a good understanding of the relative cost of electricity generation sources and a good assessment of system cost. A lot of this work is already ongoing on the international platform. Innovation is certainly essential in ensuring nuclear continues to support the increasing global energy demand. Collaborations among countries not only progress in innovative technologies effectively, but also can enable cost and knowledge sharing. 
Lastly, nuclear development can be a long process. So all involved stakeholders need to consider knowledge management, experience transfer, and training to prepare the next generation of the workforce. For that, I conclude my talk and welcome any questions. Thank you. And we will come to a Q&A session a little bit uh, later on uh, at the end of this session. We've heard from several speakers about the importance of a holistic view that takes into account the entire energy life cycle and the interface between its different components, be they different stages of the cycle odor or different uh, sources of supply. Our next presentation provides an example of that systemic perspective exploring different scenarios for integrating nuclear power into an overall low-carbon energy system. We hear from the general coordinator who's responsible for elaborating Brazil's national energy plan and its decennial energy expansion plan. He works with the Brazil's Ministry of Mines and Energy. It's a pleasure to welcome Rodolfo Zamian Danilo. And you may speak from the podium. Great to have you with us. Thank you, Melinda. Good morning, and good morning to all. I thank the IAEA for the invitation and opportunity to contribute with this year's scientific forum. I'm very glad to be here. My presentation will cover the National Energy Plan, which is one of our main instruments for energy planning. It models and analyzes the long-term impacts on an exploratory basis of different energy policies we can adopt today. One of the initial messages from the PNE 2050 report is that Brazil has abundance and diversity of energy resources. This includes several non-emitting options, such as nuclear, wind, solar, hydro, and biofuels. Therefore, our goal is to best manage this abundance. Another important message is that we will face challenges in the energy sector that are different and more complex than the ones from the past. The objective of our, of our planning is therefore to assist decision making for policy, public policy. The national plan consists of three stages, strategy design of the PNE report that has now been released for public consultancy. The second stage is to debate and implement the strategy itself and then the monitoring stage is performed continually since the PNI report in this cycle will be repeated every five years. This is the QR code for the PNI public consultancy documents. We believe that this interaction with society occurs in a timely manner, especially due to the difficult circumstances caused by the global crisis of the new coronavirus. Regarding specifically nuclear energy in Brazil, we believe to have relative positive points for its expansion. We are with one of the three countries with the combination of large uranium reserves operating plants and to dominate the fuel cycle fabrication. At the same time, there are also strategic motives to promote technology. Energy demand can increase 2.5 times until 2050, and due to demand electrification, power consumption can increase up to 3.3 times. So we need to take advantage of all sources to maintain energy security. Also, the possibility to be close to the load centers is positive in a continental country and because renewables are strongly site dependent. Lastly, and very important, there are strategic spillovers for other industries from expanding nuclear energy capacity. They relate to nuclear medicine, agriculture, hydrogen production, desalinization and defense as it was well covered yesterday in session two. Considering this context, uh, the national plan designed 12 scenarios focused on nuclear energy among a total of 64. There are scenarios that estimate the effects of expanding eight and 10 new uh, gigawatts of nuclear storm capacity until 2050. We also designed circumstances where nuclear expansion grows further as a cons consequence of capex and opex reduction. So this graph represents six four scenarios, showing the results for the net present costs and for consumers in billion dollars and the total emissions during the final year in million tons of CO2. The scenarios 
where there is actual expansion of nuclear energy capacity are highlighted with yellow axes. We can visualize they are within the group of scenarios appealing regarding the trade-off between costs and, uh, and emissions. In fact, the most aggressive scenario of nuclear expansion yields lower emissions. So we observe that nuclear energy contributes to maintain a clean energy mix in Brazil in a complementary manner with other and clean energy sources. But beyond a matter of minimizing only costs, there are the benefits to society regarding other sectors. As I mentioned, and as also did the minister yesterday, the technological positive externalities are significant. So the energy policy can benefit a lot from estimating the spillover value created by nuclear technology. In the second graph, we have the results for electricity generation share for each source. They, rep they are represented in relative terms and for the entire range of the, of the 64 scenarios. So for nuclear, it is possible to see an indication of maintenance or expansion of its share. It is also possible to observe that other sources can be very representative, especially renewable ones. And so maybe you can also coin an expression of the Brazilian low carbon uh, future. Or, so nuclear energy can contribute significantly with the power sector and with other industries without reshaping the sector altogether or causing dependency or requiring significant adaptation. And finally, on a quali qualitative basis, the National Energy Plan sets out a number of challenges for each subject and energy source, along with recommendations to address them. For nuclear energy, we've identified six challenges for the next 30 years from a public policy point of view. They encompass the following categories, communication, institutional, uh, institutional adjustments, coupling with the broader Brazilian nuclear policy, maintaining safety, continuing to prepare for the end of plants lifetime and mineral resources. To address these challenges, we've identified 10 recommendations. The objective is to create a basis to debate with society and to construct a roadmap. I would like to highlight four of them for a matter of time, although I'll go through them very quickly. They're well detailed in the report. So first, we need to create a broad communication with society. It is important to engage all stakeholders to demonstrate the opportunities that nuclear represents in terms of energy and technology. Second, it is interesting to quantify the externalities that nuclear power cause for other industries so that you can construct a better cost-benefit analysis. Another recommendation I highlight is to seek project standardization to obtain gains in economy of scope. Also, economies of scale can be pursued by planning two plants at the same site and to be built in sequence. Uh, the next three recommendations I highlight relate to safety and security, as this is a subject that has to remain a priority for us. In conclusion, we've seen this week many calls from many countries and international organizations for deep decarbonization. We strongly believe in the importance of long-term energy planning to achieve our goals of energy supply and sustainability. We are also looking closely on how nuclear energy helped us designing a low carbon future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodolfo, Damian, Dango, and you may please take this uh, seat here, and then we'll write that, that one right there, please, and then we'll come back to you shortly for uh, a brief Q&A. So our final presentation now, ladies and gentlemen, comes from a newcomer country that has been working closely with the IAEA to realize its nuclear energy ambitions. Collins Gordon Juma is the CEO of the Nuclear Power and Energy Agency in Kenya and has a wealth of experience overall in the energy sector. He joins us uh, by video. Let me take this opportunity to thank the agency for giving me opportunity to present in this scientific forum 
of the IEA General Conference. My name is Collins Juma. I'm the National Liaison Officer for Kenya and also the Chief Executive Officer of Nuclear Power and Energy Agency. My presentation is on the IEA role in fostering peaceful uses in nuclear energy and especially to my country. On my first slide, <clears throat> um, I want to give the roadmap of how we've moved with the nuclear power program in the country. And this started uh, sometime in the year 2010 when we formed the National Economic and Social Council Forum to advise the government on the, the projects that uh, uh, would lead us to a middle income economy. And uh, this is when we realized that energy being an enabler, we would need uh, different sources of, uh, of uh, baseload generation and nuclear energy was included in the energy planning uh, for the country. And around 2012 of the committee, which was formed by the National Economic Council, was converted to uh, Kenya Nuclear Electricity Board with the same mandate of uh, frustrating the, the nuclear power program in the country. And um, it moved with this mandate and the first task was to to knock at the agencies down <clears throat> and uh, get the guidelines on how member states get assistance from the agency in developing the nuclear power program. And this is how we came to learn about the milestone approach, which will be in my next slide. And uh, from the pre-feasibility study, which we studied in 2012 to 2014, we had some recommendations on the quick wins that uh, we could uh, we could uh, uh, maybe get uh, fast results, and we got a lot of support from the agency, especially when we were developing the the when we were carrying out the prefeasibility study. The board was transformed in 2019 under the Energy Act to Nuclear Power and Energy Agency to include the mandate of research and capacity building. All of us are aware of the milestone approach, and we also started like any other country <coughs> that starts with the, the program to develop the new first nuclear power plant. And as I said, that uh, after the 2012 of when we started the previous ability study, which ended in 2014, we picked uh, the recommendations that uh, the study <coughs> had uh, given out. And one of them was uh, the grid analysis uh, site characterization and uh, uh, capacity building. We also uh, started uh, the, the, the public buy-in on uh, stakeholder engagement. And uh, I would say that uh, after that, we called for an inner mission in uh, 2015, of which also I'll give uh, uh, what came out of the inner mission in the next slide. But from this screen, I would comfortably say that uh, uh, we should be in phase two uh, because uh, the recommendations that uh, were given in the NIR mission, most of them have been completed. And our uh, follow up, any follow up commission was scheduled for uh, March uh, 2020, but because of COVID, we had shifted it into December. We hope to complete it by that time. Uh, the prefeasibility study majorly covered the 19 infrastructure issues, and uh, we the, uh, we identified issues in consideration and the preparatory steps to introduce the nuclear the first nuclear power program. And I said early uh, stakeholder participation involving international partners and Kenyan government was one of the key inputs to to this study. I've also talked about INIR mission, which took place in 2015, and this one was uh, with the involvement with the nationwide participation from all relevant institutions. And uh, the finding was that Kenya has made significant progress in, in, in its preparation to make knowledgeable decision about introducing nuclear power program. And an INIR action plan was developed and uh, has been implemented since that time. As I said earlier, the follow-up mission was scheduled for March 2020, but was postponed to quarter four of 2020 
and we hope to complete that uh, exercise. Uh, one of the, 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 the pullouts in the inner mission recommendation was the establishment of a comprehensive nuclear regulatory regime. And uh, we've walked this journey since 2015 while trying to put a regulator in place. And this came to fruition in uh, 2019, December 2019, when the bill was enacted and we created a nuclear regulator, Kenya Nuclear Regulatory Authority through an act of parliament. In terms of the assistance that we are getting, uh, these are some of the major areas that we are getting assistance from the IEA. Uh, in terms of siting of the nuclear power plant, especially the preliminary studies. We always exchange notes with the IEA. We did the same when we were carrying out the preliminary electric grid study, strategic environmental assessment, the reactor technology assessment, human resource and capacity development, and international nuclear review missions. In terms of uh, Concluding my remark, I would say that uh, we've reached this end because of the partnership we've had, not only with the IEA, but other our development partners, like the countries we signed the MOUs with, like uh, Russia, uh, the United States, uh, Korea, uh, the, the Slovak Republic, uh, Ghana, and China. And I would say that uh, this has come a long way because of the government uh, 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 input and the government support in terms of financing the NEPU. Thank you very much, and that ends my presentation. Thank you very much, and we will now go to a Q&A with our uh, speakers, and I would like to begin uh, while we, our, our time is short, so we're going to get them up on screen, but meanwhile I'm going to begin with the room and ask who in the room has a question for our speakers. No hands going up yet. Then perhaps I will start out by going to Jeff to see if we have some online questions coming in. Yeah, we have a few. Thank you, Melinda. Um, we have a couple uh, regarding um, our speaker from Brazil. Uh, one question is, um, uh, starts, uh, Brazil has ambitious plans for nuclear power. Uh, the qu my question is twofold. What is the level of public acceptance in Brazil for uh, expanding nuclear power, and what plans are being considered for financing uh, these projects? Mm -hmm. It's on. Okay, thank you for the question. Well, public acceptance is a very important point in our energy planning. We are studying on how to engage society as a whole. Uh, we have a very good example from where the Angra, Angra uh, complex is situated in Angra dos Reis, with two power plants operating in one under construction. And society around this complex is very acceptable of the technology, and we hope to recreate the same level of acceptance for other regions and also for the, uh, the country as a whole. Regarding financial, fi financial, financing, we are currently uh, designing the bidding process that includes the financing and select, selecting the private partner uh, for the Angra 3 project. And we hope that this same design will be used as a basis for the next, uh, the following nuclear power plants. So we have, we are in very close talks with Eletronuclear, that is the national nuclear uh, company in Brazil, and also with the Development Bank. So the Development Bank, it was uh, hired by the ministry to design this model on how to hire and finance the Angra 3 project and, and, and also for the next uh, power plants. Thank you. That kind of picks up on the message we heard yesterday from Agneta Riesing uh, saying standardization, uh, just uh, do what you know works and then, uh, then keep repeating it. Just brief follow-up question, if I may, on two things that struck me as a little bit paradoxical in your uh, remarks. Brazil already has a great deal of hydro power. So why do you need 
nuclear. And combined with that, there's a lot of, uh, there's a real trend at the moment toward decentralized generation, yet you say it's good to uh, locate nuclear plants near load centers. So again, that seems to go kind of in a different direction. Okay, yeah, I appreciate this question because talking about Brazilian electric uh, sector is difficult without mentioning hydro. Uh, we do have a very big share of hydro. I have the number. We have nearly two thirds of the current electricity production coming from hydro. Uh, and I would like also to state that our power sector is 84% renewable today. We intend to keep it in the, in the next 10 years close, very close to this uh, level. But although hydro capacity will increase in the future, we do not increase in the same pace as other sources. So uh, we have 64% of its uh, share in power production. It will reduce to 57% uh, by the end of this decade. And so we are looking on how this uh, interacts since it's a clean and base load technology. The, uh, nuclear, uh, the nuclear power plants, we believe, uh, uh, perform the same services that other technologies, other clean technologies that are also very important, do not perform. And this centralization is also a very strong trend in Brazil. Uh, for, for, for instance, over uh, the past 12 months, solar production in Brazil has doubled, although it's, it's, it has a small share. Doubling in 12 months, I think, is significant. And we may, may multiply by many factors for the next 10 years. And lots coming from households that want to implement their own energy system they, have to, they, they want to, to, to invest in solar panels. Uh, but I, I would like to, call, to, to answer this point, pointing out that Brazil being very large, each region has a, a kind of vocation for some energy sources. For instance, the northeast part, where solar radiation is very intense and winds are very good. They have this vocation for these variable renewable sources. The southeast has a lot of oil and natural gas production, so natural gas is also still very important for Brazil. The south region, where you have coal and wind, and the north with the remaining uh, sites for hydro. Uh, so although our transmission system is very well interconnected, we need to be sure on what level of stress this uh, uh, regional differences we put on the transmission system. And nuclear, on the other hand, the site selection has been conducted by, by Electronuclear, but we have a very good indication that we have many favorable sites throughout the entire territory of Brazil, which can help us a lot with the transmission, also from the transmission point of view. Thank you very much. So again, uh, geographical particularities as one of the factors determining the right energy mix. Very interesting. Um, let's go back to Jeff and more questions perhaps uh, also for Kenya. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, we have a couple here for Kenya. Uh, first question is, why is Kenya looking at nuclear power? Uh, wouldn't it be cheaper and easier to expand renewables? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I, I mentioned in my presentation that uh, uh, there was a, a committee called National Economic and Social Council, uh, which uh, advises the government on the priority projects that uh, we need to become a middle income economy. And uh, I also said that they identified some of the projects which needed energy as an enabler. But to cut the long story short, we identified that. Uh, our our over dependence on hydro had made us vulnerable to energy shortages, and that's why we started considering the sources that we have, and we realized that we have a potential of the geothermal of a certain capacity. But we're looking forward, uh, maybe by the year 2030, 2035, and assuming that uh, the, the the base load we have in uh, geothermal is exploited and uh, we can't ex uh, uh, overstretch our hydros reach the limit, then we would need other sources. Uh, and that's the dis how the discussion of nuclear and maybe LNG came on the table. 
that we explore for long term uh, the possibility of having nuclear in, in our energy mix. Uh, well, uh, I know uh, when we talk of renewables, uh, we would also talk about wind and solar. But if we are trying to become industrialized, then I think the discussion of wind and solar, we put it aside for the time being, and we talk of the baseload generation. Uh, that's the main reason where we are considering for uh, long term the nuclear power generation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jeff? And there was a follow-up to Kenya, the question being, um, can the country afford nuclear without a strong government state-to-state -state loan? Did you uh, hear that question, uh, Collins? Did you? Yeah, you? I got yeah. It. okay, I got great. It. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Another question, whether the country can afford uh, whether the country can afford um, a nuclear without a uh, state loan. But I think this depends on um, maybe the kind of reactor we are, we'll be considering, whether we are going for the small modular reactors and uh, or whether we are going for the big reactors. But I think the model that the government would choose, uh, with us, uh, a, a lot of models that can be chosen, there could be a G2G arrangement where you can have the plant and uh, you recoup your investment, you can have the loan. So we'll have to, uh, to choose the best that is uh, good for the country. Thank you. And we're just about out of time, but let me just ask uh, also one more follow-up question. Uh, and that would be your main piece of advice, Collins, for other countries possibly embarking on uh, a path toward nuclear power, what's the single most important thing they need to keep in mind in working together with the agency, with the IAEA? Yeah, from our experience for the last eight years or so, we've realized that, uh, uh, I mean, developing a nuclear power program is uh, it's not uh, like making instant coffee. So there have to be, you have to be patient enough to follow the graded approach of uh, of the agency in terms of the milestone approach. And uh, uh, this is the way to go, I would say, for other newcomer countries. Uh, there's really no shortcut. The patience has to be there because you have to grow in steps in terms of the infrastructure issues. Thank you very much. And uh, perhaps we'll use our last uh, half a minute uh, to just uh, come to you, uh, Gloria, with the request, if you would, for a short answer, uh, please. Uh, there's been a good deal of talk during the forum about the role of the private sector. And I wonder if you could just tell us very briefly how governments can best support private investors in nuclear power. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I think I quickly touch on that uh, in my presentation is uh, government support in terms of perhaps considering um, policies like uh, policy in incentives to to aid private uh, uh, industries or private investors to look into uh, uh, ways to, you know, to encourage them to conduct uh, R&D, for example, because in my presentation, I mentioned the importance of innovations. Uh, I suggested R&D tax credit, perhaps, or sometimes in, in some cases, uh, countries have received direct government support. And these are uh, very um, uh, successful, successful examples that countries have, have shown us. Uh, but of course, uh, policies can come in all, all ways or, or forms, and there are many uh, different combinations that uh, governments can support. Uh, but I, I did uh, provide a couple of examples in my talk. Thank you very much. And Jeff, any other question for Gloria before we close our uh, session? There was, a, there was a, a specific question about carbon pricing uh, and what the main hurdles were to for uh, for carbon pricing to be to be in, implemented in what the NEA's position was on on this uh, mechanism, Gloria. So <laughs> good luck answering that one quickly. <laughs> okay, uh, we we certainly see that carbon pricing is one way, uh, the, probably a very effective way to uh, to make the market more fair. And uh, of course, that is something that it has to be negotiated and it has to be planned out by the governments. Uh, different countries, they have their own policies, they, their own priorities. So um, I, I don't want to go you know, uh, into details because that, this could be a very uh, long discussion. But definitely, we see that as one uh, if, if effective way that we can, um, you know, to have policies to really uh, value, to design the market to value clean energy and, and the security that nuclear can provide.
carbon pricing combined with life cycle assessment would, of course, make uh, determining the right clean energy mix a great deal easier. Thank you very, very much to all of our speakers for this very interesting discussion. Also to everybody online uh, who's submitting uh, great questions and, uh, and also to our audience here in the room for your contributions and your attention. That brings to a close our last technical session at the Scientific Forum, but we have the closing session with the Director General to very much look forward to, and we have several other exciting speakers joining us for that as well. But first, we're going to take a one-hour break to disinfect this room according to uh, the hygiene rules here in Austria. That's important for us to do. So we do ask for everybody's understanding that we will now take an hour break. But please don't go away, dear online audience. Take your own break and rejoin us uh, in one hour from now. And same to all of those in the room. We hope to see you back here shortly. Thanks again for your attention and thanks to our speakers. Let's give them a good round of applause.